5.7 it's negative 2.5 degrees looks like we're going fishing Location number one, no good, can't get to it, that's flooded. So right now we're off to location number two and it should be a little bit better. It should be, well, it's a bit less covered by the by the trees. You know beggars can't be fucking choosers, you know. I'm kinda sitting here in between uh, sleet and snow showers still the journey hasn't hasn't got uh, above negative figures it's the whole whole journey down there's a couple of interesting uh, corners and a couple of wee interesting points in the road where the car was telling me it didn't like driving on this but uh, yeah we're going fishing that's the main thing. And here we are, we're finally fishing. The first couple of roads that get to this place were uh, flooded out. So we had to uh, use forestry roads, which was uh, a bit of a challenge. It's not very easy to go off-road vehicle driving in a, in a two-wheel drive VW Caddy, but the van got here in the end. I'm fishing... I'm fishing in Fermanagh, I'm not going to tell you where I'm fishing, but... Right now I'm fishing behind an island, so the island's taking the brunt of the wind. If you just go past the island into the main direction of the wind, the water looks like you could surf on it. But I'm kind of sheltered here. Uh, we're in a forestry, as you can see. I've got two rods sitting in at the minute. I'm going to get a third rod out now. I am going to put it out with the bait boat, because it's still kind of shallow, still kind of... Uh, calm and behind the island so if I go out to where the out where it drops off into the deeper water then it's uh it'll be better for the bit. Not rod I'm gonna put a big bit. Which leads me on to uh part three of my how to use big bits series. That'll be in another video. On this road, on the left hand road, I have a nice fat smelt on the rod that's closest to the camera, I have a big old brown trout. Brown trout's popped up before I froze it, I popped it up so it's popped up off the bottom. The smelt's one of these uh, turbo boils that you get from Neville Ficklin off uh, Loose Bits in Gainsborough. But it seems the, the forest track that I'm on seems to be pretty common, uh, pretty favourite with runners. I just had about 30 guys come past jogging and I think 28 of them stopped and asked me how I was doing and did I catch anything? Oh well, at least the locals are friendly. Now we have hailstones and snow. <laughs> this is how cold it was last night. I put a litre of milk in my cool in my food bag. I've just opened it to pour a cup of coffee and the uh, top half inch of the milk was uh, frozen solid. So it was a nippy one last night. But it's all good. I have my cup of coffee. I've got the baits in. All I need now is a pipe to turn up. And today wouldn't seem so bad. Well, not that it's bad anyway. It's, uh, it's, a good day. it's always a good day when you're out fishing. I've got these Ridge Monkey cups, thermal cups, they're just plastic cups to get them in like a pack of two for like 16, 17 pound. They're actually surprisingly good. You know, they keep your brew warm, they've got a good seal, they're easy to clean. So yeah, well done Ridge Monkey. I should probably say well done to the the little guy in the Chinese sweatshop that's pumping them out too, but I don't think he's got internet.
or is listening. But yeah, well worth the pennies. I'm going to go through my, uh, my rig with you today. I'm using a standard running ledger rig. Oh, the sun's just gone behind the trees there. So here you have your your clip, your two ball bearing swivels. So this can turn freely. So when the pike's twisting in the water, you're not twisting up your line. Here it is a Catfish Pro run ring. This is a ceramic ring with a metal collar, and that's attached to about two feet of 10 pound mono, and that's just a four ounce lead. I use 24 inches of rig tubing because I'm keeping my rod tip high. If there's any zebra mussels on the bottom, the rig tubing is protecting the main line so the line won't get uh, damaged. The trace is a 45 pound American fishing wire leading leader trace with uh, two size four owner trebles. And I have a nice sexy smelt. Hello, how are you? I don't want to be eaten. Shut up, smelt. I'm a big fan of oils. A big fan of injecting oil into my bait. But to do that, you need to do that with one of these. So you need to be really, really careful. Otherwise, you're going to stick that into that. Then it's a trip to the hospital to get a tetanus injection. So don't do that. The oil I use is uh, Eddie Turner's own brand oil. He makes this himself. If you don't know who Eddie Turner is, go and Google him. He's written books about pike fishing. The guy has caught some truly epic pike. Down. Now when it comes to ejecting your bit, you want to puncture the bit nice and gently. Don't go stabbing it like a psychopath. Four or five punctures, injections into the cavity of the bit. And then just start injecting. Only a, only a millimeter at a time, milliliter, milliliter at a time is good. This is a smelt oil. It just gives the bit that extra zing. And now we're gonna cast this out. I'm gonna put the hook back in it first of all, but then we're gonna cast it out. There you go. A nice smelt, ready to catch pike. It's a bit weird where I'm fishing here, because of the trees and stuff. So I'm going to have to uh, cast a bit strange. And there we're on the bottom. Keeping the rod tip up high because there's a lot of sunken trees and snags in at my feet. And you don't want to get your line caught in the snags. So there you go. Smacking up your bit. We up did just had a drop run. I struck in. I felt the shake and it popped off. That was on the smelt rod, so if another smelt cast out again. Hmm, so at least there's pike in the swim. I'm sitting watching all the uh, shoal fish surfacing at the minute, so there's there's fish here, which is good at. Uh, I just need to actually put a pike in the net so I can unhook it and then I can hold it up like this. Or hold it out like that there at arm's length to make a 10 pound pike look like it's 40 pound. I know what you're doing. <laughs> Somebody said in one of my videos that I talk 
like I'm selling stuff to people. It's not my intention at all. If I use something, it's because I uh, have confidence in it. If by default, me having confidence in my fishing tackle, the stuff that I use, if by default that I tell people that it's good gear and they go out and buy it, happy days. I'm not sponsored by anybody. I don't get nothing free. I have to buy everything that I fish with. But if there's any tackle manufacturers out there looking to sponsor people, hey, man, you, you might have to be putting over 18 stickers on your adverts because I might let out the odd sweary word. Gonna discuss another rig. This one here is mostly for fishing with with live bits. Now, here in Northern Ireland, or actually here in the Republic of Ireland where I am right now, live baiting, not allowed to do it. So use your own judgment. If you're not allowed to do it in the area where you are, well then that's up to you. The old saying here goes, it's illegal to be caught. So, this is my sunken float rig. Starts off with an uptress. This uptress is three feet. This is 90 pound AFW surf strand. Very strong, very stiff, bomb proof wire. This is one of these little fox uptress rotary bead things. The thinking being, that the bait tress can spin around. I'll do this without catching myself. This will be interesting. There you go. The bait tress. See, I caught myself. The bait tress can spin around. The fish can go where it wants to. But the bait tress isn't longer than the up tress. So if the bait decides to swim up, it's not going to get into any area where there's mono. A sort of belt and braces approach, lads. I'd prefer to go heavy than go too light. So there you have it, there's the top of the bait tress and there's still an extra 10 inches of wire. This little thing is a rattle. When you attach your, your fish to this, or this to your, your live bit, this little thing rattles. This little thing agitates the live bit, it irritates it, it annoys it. So the more the live bit moves around, the more this rattles and the pike come in to investigate what's that noise. Now, you're not going to be able to see it, but this has been uh, well used because it's very scraped up. But the thinking being, at the top of your up trace, you have one of these. This is heavy duty foam. This is an underwater float or a sunken float. Uh, I'll put a link to where you can get these in the description. They, you come in different sizes. You get ones like that, you get ones like that. They're both good. It depends. If you're using a small bit, you'd use that. If you're using a slightly bigger bit, you'd use that. It's your own common sense. Those floats would sit, if you can imagine that there's mainline coming down, they would sit basically there. So your floats at the top, then your mainline, your up trace is down to your bait trace, and at the bottom you have, if I can untangle the thing, you have your lead link. Your lead link can be three, four, five feet. It depends how much you want to raise it off the bottom, but you have to remember if you're going to cast it, a long lead link makes it difficult to cast. So, lead link, 10 pound mono, through to a 4 inch lead, no big deal. I've put knots in the, up on the lead link, so if it gets snagged it breaks off without problems. And again, you might think for all the moving parts this is going to be an absolute tangle fest. Surprisingly not. I find that if you use a really stiff uptress, it cuts down the tangles. I was actually thinking about using a uh, solid strand titanium wire, but I haven't quite worked the kinks out of that one just yet, so I'll stick with the uh, the 90 pound surf strand. <coughs> really, as I showed you that I was going to use this, uh, I didn't show you how you use it. Eat that easy guys. Unscrew the bottom. Set the stone out the This little thing is what you put your coffee in, this is what you put your water in. It holds about enough to get 
one cup of coffee. Coffee I'm using, veteran coffee, quite like this, really good. This is lethal balloon, this is kind of in the middle. It's uh, It doesn't quite blow the tits off you, but it's, it gives it a good go. Fill up your fill up your coffee like that. Just move it down a bit. You don't want to overfill it. Doesn't do anything. Then you screw your lid down. There you go. Now you set it on the cooker. We're going to see how long it takes for this to uh, to get you ready to rock and roll. Now that water was cold, so we'll just see how long it takes. I'm 
And there you have it. Coffee. It dribbles a bit, but you just have to... There you have it, one cup of uh, really, really good coffee made with the Navitas coffee maker. From starting to stopping, this uh, GoPro is telling me that it's nine minutes. So nine minutes, that's how long it takes you to get a good cup of coffee. Update time. Nothing since that dropped run. crossing my fingers that it's not another blank. I had a cormorant. <laughs> 18 foot of water and I had a cormorant that dived down and took a trout. Still, it was a good scrap. These swims, they're very overgrown. So it's worth bringing something that with you. That is, uh, you're able to clear your swim a wee bit. Just to get soaked with in here again. It's not always practical to bring like a fucking massive big chainsaw and stuff like that with you fishing. But I do have a saw in the van, I do have a small axe in the van for bushcrafting. I quite like bushcrafting as well. Quite enjoy camping, quite enjoy the outdoors. But uh, my normal carry for like bushcrafting and other things is this. This is a this is made by Shred. It's a well, does this isn't a tin? It's a knife. It's a very thick backed knife. It is a uh, very strong, holds an edge well. It's got an interesting pommel. If you had to crack something, uh, you could use the pommel. If your van was in the water and you were having to smash out the windscreen, the uh, pommel would be quite good at that. The the promotional video for it, there's like holes in the handle where you can attach it to the end of a stick and spear things. I live in Northern Ireland. We don't have like monsters and wild animals like bears and stuff like that that you have to kind of attach to a stick and spear. You know. Anyway, but that's what the holes are for. I suppose you could attach some uh, paracord to the end of it as well if you wanted. But that's it. The sheath is uh, high quality, very well made. It's got molly attachments that you could put onto your backpacks. And uh, in there, there's a ceramic edge. So if you had to sharpen it in the field, you could get enough of a, an edge on it. But there you go. My bushcrafting knife. Now, legally, this is illegal. In Northern Ireland, carrying a fixed blade in public is illegal. So, I'm not too sure where that stands in the law when I'm fishing. I mean, is this more dangerous than the cooking knife that I have, the knife I have in the cook the bag for the cooking stuff? You know, they're both blades that could both do damage to people. I just wonder what the law is on the uh, on carrying knives. Perhaps one of the UK uh, bushcrafting enthusiasts could uh, could possibly advise. Now, Northern Ireland is bound to be different to the rest of the UK because it's Northern Ireland and it's daft. But uh, anyway, that's what I carry. It's a uh, been with me for a while, does the job. Just another update. I've changed one of the bits from a trout to an eelhead. It's a, it's a good job that I'm using the rig, the rig tubing on the bottom of the, the main line. The rig tubing is getting kind of slab. I must be fishing over a bed of zebra bustles. 
The zebra mussels are a, an invasive species. They're not from, they're not native to this country. Apparently they came in the, the, the bilge water of ocean going canal boats and stuff like that there. And they came into the Shannon system. Now the Shannon system and the urn system in Ireland is connected now. So they just ripped through the urn. This happened in the, in the 90s. Now I used to do a lot of uh, match fishing. I can remember areas where I would be going match fishing and catching nice big lumps of bream and roach bream hybrids. And now if you go to those same places you're not going to get anything. What the zebra mussel does, it's a filter feeder. It's highly, it breeds very fast and it basically sticks to anything that's, that's hard for it. So your native swan mussels basically get engulfed by hundreds of these little zebra mussels and they starve to death. So the native swan mussels are all but gone now from they are all but gone from most of the urn. Uh, there is no way to uh, to clean them out of the out of the lock. Bar drain the lock, scour them off, and let them dry. Hard frosts and shallow waters tend to kill them, but we haven't had a decent hard frost. I know today has been cold, but we haven't had a a sustained period of cold weather for a while. Uh, there's, I don't, as far as I'm, as far as I know, there's no fish that eats them really. They're of no nutritional value to, to anything. They just filter out the zooplanktons in the water. Uh, that's an important building block for everything else. It might sound good that the water clarity has increased in Loch Nairn, but with increased water clarity, that means more weed growth. It means potential algae blooms. And uh, it takes away the building blocks for pretty much everything that swims. It takes away the early food source for pretty much everything that swims, making it harder. Now, have the shoals of bream from the from the urn disappeared? Well, no. They've, there is still some huge shoals of bream in the urn, but they've moved to areas that don't have the zebra mussels. If you're on a boat with an echo sounder, you can find huge, huge shoals of them. But unless you're going to start having your match competitions on speedboats, to you know, you're not going to get. The, I think the days of the match angler coming to the Loch Ern is is sadly coming, sadly dwindling, which is a shame because fishing for the local economy adds millions of pounds. The uh, the match anglers, okay, still there's still some good weights get caught, but nowhere near what it used to be like. Nowhere near it. I don't really do match fishing. Well, in fact, I don't do match fishing anymore. I just get bored. I don't like the competitiveness. It doesn't do anything for me anymore. I'm the sort of guy that would draw a peg that's uh, at the very end of the thing, so it'd be like six miles away. You know, so it'd be. I just kind of. I didn't have the taste for it. I still fish for bream. My summer fishing tends to be uh, feeder fishing for bream and tench and roach, perch. In the winter I switch to pike. Um, pike fishing is my main passion. I love pike fishing. They're the apex predator. So why wouldn't you fish for the apex predator? Unfortunately, the urn system gets it very, very hard. There's a lot of angling pressure uh, on the urn system to this day. There's still commercial nets. 2019, and we still have commercial nets. And the last study that I read from uh, the idiots in charge, they're actually talking about commercial nets viable for perch. So perch being a lot smaller, that's going to catch a lot more roach, perch, bream, trout. That's just the legal netting. Then you have the illegal stuff. Then you have the Eastern Europeans. Now again, not all Eastern Europeans. There are some good ones. 
And then you have the, the people who kill everything they catch. Then you have the the trout anglers on there that hate pike. They fucking hate pike. If they catch a pike, they'll dance on the top of it. They'll kill it. Because according to them, the pike eat all their trout. I'll tell you a little story. I was fishing on the upper lock. I was fishing off one of the wooden jetties. Uh, I'd put out a roach dead bit. Not a big dead bit, just a normal size six inch roach dead bit. And I was sitting down, I was having a, a cup of coffee and I was kind of relaxing and chilling out. As is my want, you know. This guy comes down and starts to talk to me, you know, the usual, have you caught the thing, blah blah blah. Turns out this fella's an angler as well. He's a trout angler. And then he went on to a tirade. It lasted a good 15 minutes, this. About how the pike have killed all the trout, and this used to be an excellent trout fishery, and the pike should be controlled, the pike should be gill netted, the pike should be eradicated to save the poor trout. Now, saying this to a pike angler, I'm quite passionate about pike fishing. I kind of, well, I was polite. I wasn't going to tell the old man to fuck off. I just kind of nodded and listened to him and hoped that he would piss off, you know. My rod went. I wound down, struck into it, and it was a very jagged fight. I knew exactly what it was as soon as I set the hooks into it. It came to the net and it was a big, beautiful brown trout, massive big thing, with the uh, roach bit well in its mouth. And he was standing, you know, inches from me the whole time I was playing this and the whole time I netted it and then I took it out and unhooked it. And he turned around and he, he was kind of in shock that a, a trout was eating a bit for pike. And I took the hooks out and I slipped it back in and away it went. And I laughed at him and said, Maybe it's not the pike that's destroying the trout fishing, maybe it's just you trout anglers or crap. I mean, if only a pike angler like me can catch a fish that size, then clearly you're doing something wrong. Well, you would have thought he'd caught me a finger in his wife. Jesus, he went nuts. That was a bit of a bonus that day. Wound up an idiot, caught some good fish, and... <laughs> Just wish I had fished today to show you. Come on, come on fish, come on! That's it now for the day. Bad rain's just getting brutal. The wind's changed direction, it's now, it's now, it was now right in my face. That was uh, too much for me. I just have to make it up this uh, dirt track now. Tells you how bad the wind is, you know. The wind has been horrific. And there you have it, another day over a blank. But hey, uh, not many catch fish sitting on the sofa. I left kind of early. The uh, wind just switched, it just was battering into my face and that driving rain was just, there was just nothing happening. It just, you could feel it getting colder and colder and colder. We're still only sitting at, uh, well, according to the car, we're sitting at uh, one and a half degrees. So it's been, it's been pretty cold all day. It's sleet, hailstones and uh, at the end there, driving rain. No, it's a uh, time to go home and.